morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Church. My name is Alex Fernandez. I'm one of the pastors at Cornerstone and the pastor here at the Heritage Hill Campus. I want to welcome all of you who are here today, those of you who are joining us online. Uh, Just three quick announcements as uh, we start the message today. Uh, We got news from one of our community partners, Family Promise. They're uh, one of our many community partners here in the community who is focused on homelessness, specifically for families providing uh, temporary shelter and also long-term solutions for uh, for for uh, homeless families. And uh, one of their programs that has been around for decades is called Interfaith Hospitality Network. And that is where they house people, uh, families in churches all throughout the city throughout the year. And we got news that they're, because of funding, they were cutting that program uh, this week. And so uh, we lift up Family Promise. There's other shelters that they're gonna be using uh, to help uh, house families. We're still gonna work with Family Promise on things like the Family Promise Christmas Store and other initiatives. One of the things they said they, that they do need is for those families in shelter is providing meals for them. And so if you have any questions around uh, Family Promise, if you've been part of that, we've had hundreds of people participate. We've been a part of that for 27 years as a, as a host church for that. So our heart grieves for, for that, uh, but also there's different ways to participate. So if you have any questions about that, uh, you can contact Tracy Bauer. She's our director of outreach. She can help you learn uh, different ways that we can connect, but we lift up Family Promise here this morning for that. Um, uh, the other thing I'm going to mention is that um, uh, we're going to celebrate the Sacrament of Communion every week in this series. We're going to do it a little bit different each time on your way in. You should have received one of these cups. If you didn't, and especially those who, are, who snuck in the door over here because we didn't have an usher there, if you could raise your hand, we can get one of these for you if you want to participate in that. Raise them high so our ushers can see you and get you one of those. Uh, if you're not familiar with uh, what communion is or what this is, is all about, I'll explain it at the, at the end, but I would love to have you guys all uh, participate, and we celebrate everybody being welcome to do that. So, uh, And for all of you watching online, grab any elements, whether it's uh, juice and bread, crackers and water, whatever you have to participate in that. Also this week, we kicked off our Around the Table study on Wednesday nights, and we had over 50 people participate in that, so that was really cool to see people come together. Uh, if you want to still jump in, it's not too late. Uh, the only thing we would ask is if, that it, if you have children, uh, infants through fifth grade, could you notify me because we have child care workers who are here, so we just love to get a count. Kids eat from 6 to 6.30. We all eat together during the hour, 6.30 to 8, and it's a great way to continue on in the series that we're in going a little bit deeper and getting connected with one another. And that's uh, what we're doing those for. Um, Transitioning here, if you were paying attention to the news over the last few months, uh, you might have missed this story, uh, but if you love sandwiches, maybe you didn't. Uh, And and, uh, the reason I say that is uh, in July of this year, earlier this year, uh, there was a news story that broke that Boar's Head Food uh, had a contamination and a listeria outbreak Uh, that ended up impacting uh, many people. 57 people uh, to date had been hospitalized. Nine deaths have occurred across 18 states. Uh, And the root cause of the contamination uh, was traced back to their Jarrett, Virginia uh, liverwurst plant. Who are the liverwurst eaters in the room? You probably were aware if that's the case. Uh, that there was a contamination and investigators, uh, when they went into that plant, actually found mold and mildew uh, near sinks that uh, were used for hand washing uh, in areas where food was ready to be handled. Uh, And the result was a recall of 7 million pounds of lunch meat over the last few months, affecting 71 different product lines, not just liverwurst. Uh, They made the hard decision to discontinue Uh, the plant in Jarrett, Virginia, and close it permanently. It resulted in 500 people losing their jobs. Uh, And so right now they're in the transition of severance and waste uh, for those individuals to find work again. Uh, I share that because it is an example of how a small infestation uh, can have a tremendous effect beyond what originally started it. And so welcome into week two of our series, Undivided. Uh, And in this series, we are studying the book of Galatians. 
uh, which I think is one of the most relevant books of the Bible to what we face today. It, it talks specifically about division in the church and the dangers of, of contamination from the inside out. And so last week, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about corporate unity uh, as a church, that uh, to, to keep unity in the church, the mission has to be greater than our personal conviction. Uh, and uh, that... Uh, Unity does not meet 100% agreement with everybody all the time. That, that was the foundation of chapter one. This week, we're gonna talk a little bit about what personal accountability, what, what is my responsibility in keeping that unity. And uh, to, again, to give us some context of what's happening, this is a story that after the resurrection of Jesus over many years, takes us to the time that we're, that we're reading about in Galatians, but it actually starts much earlier than that. Uh, at, at the beginning of the Jesus movement, it was, it was very much a 100% Jewish movement. That is, the Jewish people recognized Jesus as the Messiah that had been promised, and they, their hearts were cut that the Messiah was here, and they became, became not only believers in Jesus, but believed this was a continuation of their story. Uh, and the, this account is, is captured for us in the book of Acts, which is the book of history that we have that details the birth of the church. Uh, but right away in the book of Acts, you hardly get too many chapters in. In chapter eight, we start to see that this message, the good news of Jesus is not just for a specific people group, but that it's for all people. In fact, in Acts chapter eight, we see Samaritans, which had been uh, not only rivals, but hated people among the Jewish people. The, the Samaritans are receiving the good news of Jesus and the Holy Spirit is pouring down on them. And then in chapter 10, we're gonna look at chapter 10 because it talks about an experience of a specific person that we're gonna read about in Galatians chapter two. Uh, and it's a, it's a figure that is all throughout the story of Jesus and that is the apostle Peter. Now in Acts chapter 10, Peter has an experience uh, he's on the road north of Jerusalem and near a town called Caesarea. The location doesn't matter, uh, but he has a vision. In fact, one day he goes on the top of a rooftop to pray. And at the same time, there is a vision that another person has. It's a Roman centurion. Uh, this is a Roman soldier, somebody who's in charge of, uh, of many soldiers. Uh, but he says he's a God-fearing Gentile. A Gentile is just simply somebody who's not Jewish. And they both have a vision. Uh, the centurion has a, uh, has a vision about Peter, that, that he's, he's to bring Peter to his home, but Peter on the rooftop has a vision uh, that opens his eyes. And it's a strange vision. When I say vision, it's a dream, and he sees animals coming down, and, and, and what's revealed to him is that the Jewish customs and laws that prohibited, prohibited them eating certain foods was no longer valid. This was... A, this was this was something that, that uh, startled Peter. Uh, and, and it may, made him begin to question uh, his beliefs that he had grown up with. Un unaware of what this vision truly meant, he then gets summoned to the home of this centurion and they bring him there and they share this, both of their dreams with one another. And Jesus begins to proclaim the good news of Jesus to this Roman centurion, a Gentile, a non-Jewish person, and in the story, just like in the book of Acts earlier on, the Holy Spirit descends on that home. And people repent, and the Spirit is poured down on this family. And Peter is astounded with what he's witnessed and he's seeing. And continuing on in chapter 11, he goes back to the disciples to share his experience. And this is what he says. He's telling them, recanting the story, and he says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come down on us in the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, listen to what it says. They, meaning all the disciples, had no further objections and praised God saying, so then, even to the Gentiles, all of us, God has granted repentance that leads to life. 
There's no objection. Uh, Peter has this vision. He has this experience. He says, man, I was there. And I proclaimed the good news of Jesus. And just like it happened to us at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down. It was the same Holy Spirit. I felt it in the room. And their hearts were changed. And they were baptized with the Spirit. The good news of Jesus is not just for us. It's for all people. And the disciples, said, it says, they had no further objection. they like, we believe you. Case closed. No more conflict. Not so fast. As the Gentiles, again, on Jewish people, started to turn to the faith, uh, concern started to spread among Jewish Christian believers. I say Jewish Christian. There wasn't such a thing back then. It was just Jewish believers in Jesus. There, there was concerns that came up. that and they, they centered around two questions. So if the Gentiles are going to be part of this as well, they had two questions. Do they need to become Jews to be followers of Jesus? And do they have to observe the laws and practices and customs that we have? Those are two valid questions. Uh, and the most vocal of that, we introduced some people last week as we started chapter one. The most vocal were people who the Bible calls Judaizers. And, that was, and, that, and they were teaching uh, a different gospel that, that it wasn't just about faith in Jesus, but it was about practicing these same customs and that you had to conform. And they were starting to influence the early church. Specifically, we see that in the book of Galatians. We talked about that last week, that people started to believing the Judaizers and, and, and they were influenced, and it started to cause division inside the church. Two different sects, uh, Jews and Gentiles, not the same. You're not good enough unless you practice what we practice. And that's what started to happen. And not just in Galatia, but it started to spread all throughout the, the, the Mediterranean in, in different places in Greece, where the, where, from Jerusalem all the way to Greece where, where the churches had been planted. And the division caused so much conflict. This confusion was so great that, that they had to hash it out. And that is captured in Acts chapter 15. It is called the Council of Jerusalem. This is the bur big first church meeting and dispute. Acts chapter 15, all the leaders of the church, the disciples, the big leaders who have, that have, have come to prominence in the day, everybody who would be looked at as a leader of the movement goes to Jerusalem to hash it out and decide once and for all, what's going to happen? In fact, that's what, how, how it's accounted in Acts chapter 15. They're, they're accounting what I, uh, this is stating what I just said. It said certain people, they're talking about the Judaizers, came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles about this question. So that's the beginning of this, this council that all the biggest names in the faith are there. And they're talking about these Judaizers who are, who are bringing in this false teaching and what they're going to do. And then guess who shows up at the scene? the very people they're talking about. It says in verse five, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. So here now we actually have some insight into who these Judaizers were. They were, the Phar they were Pharisees. Now, if you know the story of Jesus, the Pharisees were the ones that Jesus had the most conflict with. In fact, they plotted to kill Jesus. But these aren't people who are against the movement. Again, these are people, Pharisees. Even Pharisees' hearts were changed and they believed in Jesus. They were just struggling to give up their customs and beliefs. Again, we talked about this last week. Do you just drop everything you've ever known when it comes to your faith? If somebody comes along and says you're wrong, um, you know, we've all grown up in, in different places. We're shaped by the culture we grew up in, in, in the community that we grew up in, in the household we grew up in. Many of your beliefs that you carry today, you may not even recognize, are the ones that your parents gave you. The way you see the world, the, look, the way you look at social topics, even the way you look at political topics. 
probably was shaped in the home that you grew up in. Either that you adopt what your parents believe or you disagree so sharply that you pick the opposite of what they believe in that case, right? We are shaped by those things, our core beliefs. And so when somebody comes along and says, it doesn't count anymore, what are you supposed to do? Just drop it? And so that's what the Judaizers were arguing is no. Uh, we, our, our, our faith system, our customs, our laws are worth keeping. And, and if the Gentiles are gonna be included in this, then they should follow these things. And then there was a sharp debate at the council. I could only imagine what it looked like. This is, this, this is, the, this is the, the crossroads for the church. This is the make or break moment for, for where this thing is gonna go. Either Gentiles, all, believe, all people are gonna be welcomed into this or not. And again, keeping on the focus of Peter. Even Peter gets up at the council and it says, he says this, after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. He's talking at the council. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he told, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. So it's Peter is standing up at the council and he's saying the Gentiles should be included. I've witnessed this. He's retelling it there. Others stand up. Paul declares what he's experienced. Everybody's arguing, but at the very end, the, the brother of, uh, of Jesus, James, who is the, the leader in the church in Jerusalem, stands up and it says, Acts 15, 19, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning towards God. Case closed, harmony in the church. Not so fast. Not so fast. I finally now have brought you to Galatians chapter 2. And Galatians chapter two helps us understand how ugly it can get when division creeps its way into the local church. Galatians chapter two starts off like this. This is Paul writing now. Then after 14 years, I went up to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas, I took Titus along also. So chapter one, he, he, he's, he's addressing his bewilderment that the Galatians have been fooled by these Judaizers. He's retelling the story that they already know. And he's maybe referring to the Council of Jerusalem here. We're not exactly sure. We'll come back to that in a second. But then he begins to recount a confrontation between two people uh, who the Galatians, if they were there, were sure to remember. Two people who you would not think would get into conflict with one another. Verse 11, Paul writes, when Cephas came to Antioch, Cephas is, is Peter. This is his Jewish name. He's using his Jewish name. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For be, before certain men came from James, talking about people from Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles. He's talking about a Peter again. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. He's using a lot of buzzwords here. Circumcision group is the Jews, Jewish believers. The other Jews joined him in his, his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So something's happening in the Galatian church. Peter, when he, go, when he comes to visit the Galatian church and, and there's a group of believers, we talked about this last week again, the Galatian church, what made up their makeup very different was it was a group of Gentile and Jewish believers in Jesus, probably more so, half of, more than half of them were Gentiles. And when Peter comes to town, he has no problem sitting down and eating and being like the Gentiles. But when certain people shows up, he gets up away from the table and, and he pretends, he distances himself. He distances himself from them. And, and Paul calls out his hypocrisy. And it says, verse 14, he says, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas Peter in front of them all, 
You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So he confronts them in public. There's a disagreement in the church. Church leaders. This is Ken Nash and and Alex Fernandez going at it in front of the congregation right here. Right? This is, hey, I'm I'm the good guy in this story. (laughs) Ken, you're wrong. You're a hypocrite. (laughs) This is what's happening. Imagine being in a church and the church leaders are arguing in front of the whole congregation. Now, I will pause here. I shared this on on our Wednesday night class. It is extremely important to understand when you read the scriptures, there is both descriptive scripture and prescriptive. I'll cover this for those who weren't there. Descriptive scripture is something that is just giving us an account of the story. It's describing what happened. Okay, prescriptive is telling us how we should, what should we should do and what we should not do. Okay, this is not an example of prescriptive scripture. Okay, the account of David and Goliath is a story of how a young shepherd boy slayed a giant. It is not a story to tell us that when we encounter bullies, we should sink a stone into their forehead and kill them, okay? It's a descriptive story. A prescriptive scripture is like when Jesus says, you know, love one another as I've loved you, therefore that's how you should love one another. That's giving us all instruction on how we're doing it. So because Paul confronts Peter in public, this is not an example that we should put people on blast when we have disagreements with them. This is is just telling us what happened in the story. Not right, wrong, or indifferent, this is what happened. We're we're gonna find out later on in Paul's writings in the book of Galatians how we're supposed to handle conflict, but he chooses to do this publicly in front of everyone. Now, what's interesting about this story is you have to wonder, did this happen before the Council of Jerusalem? Is this evidence that, you know, Peter, who had this vision, who stood up at the council and defended the Gentiles, somehow had a change of heart? Or did this happen after? Did this happen after the council of Jerusalem? To help us understand that even Peter, one of the pillars of the church, who Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He's talking about Peter. I'm going to build my church on your shoulders. That even Peter was vulnerable to inviting division in the church. Either way, this story is an example for us that anyone can fall victim to the seeds of division. And the point of today, the big idea today is that unity starts with you. And when I ever say you, I mean you. And when you're looking at me, it starts with me. That there is personal accountability that we each have, that when we talk about unity within the church, it starts with every single person making sure that if we say we wanna keep unity in the church, that I have personal accountability to keep that unity that my actions and behaviors matter. That I can get all caught up in how you're behaving, but it starts with me. I should do some self-reflection on what am I doing uh, to invite unity or disunity into the church. That's the, that's the forefront. And the warning in the text is that, that we trick ourselves and we think, well, I hear that story, but I wouldn't be the type of person who, do, who invites division in the church. I wouldn't be influenced by other people the way Peter was influenced by the Judaizers or whatever the time. I I wouldn't be that type of person. And, And the warning is, if it happened to Peter, it could happen to you. Because it's real easy to build up differences with people and build up walls. It is effortless to throw shade at comments on people on social media and demean people and participate in conflict. It's real easy for disagreements to turn into contempt for people that you disagree with. 
And it starts with you. Here's why this whole story matters. Um, when Jesus was arrested and, and he had his final meal with his friends. We, that's what we celebrate in the sacrament of communion. We're going to do that in just a few minutes. When Jesus has his final meal with his closest friends and even one who had, who had sharp disagreement with and betrayed him. The Gospel of John gives us a, a, a broader picture of what happens in that story. It wasn't just a meal that happened. Uh, in, in, during that night, the Gospel of John captures Jesus washing the feet of his disciples in that story. Jesus talks about the betrayal in detail of what's going to happen to him. Uh, Jesus comforts his disciples as he talks about what's about to happen in the future uh, of where everything is going. In the Gospel of John, he prays specifically for his disciples. He prays for their safety. Uh, he prays for the mission, that they'll have the ability to carry out his mission, the one that he's going to give him to bring the good news uh, of his resurrection to everybody. He prays for all these things, and he prays for, for people who this message would one day reach. He's talking about you and I. And I want to capture this prayer that Jesus says because it gives us some insight into why this is all so important. So these are the words of Jesus. In John chapter 17, he says, my prayer is not for them alone, not just the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one and I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Unity matters to Jesus. Uh, unity matters so much to Jesus that it should matter to us. What, Je what Jesus is talking about here, and if you really read his words, he's saying, the mission of my church is dependent on my people's ability to stay united in the midst of division. It's mission critical that if the church wants to change the hearts of the world and turn them towards Christ, they need to be unified. They need to not just say they're unified, they need to exhibit that unity in a way that people will truly believe that, I, that God sent his son into the world. And that when we see Christians at odds with one, with one another, it should bother us. When we see Christians divided with one another, it should cut to our hearts just like it cuts to the heart of Jesus. And it should lead us to pray and it should lead us towards resolution. But at the, at the forefront of all of that, it's to ensure it's, it, that we must ensure that we aren't the ones that are that opening the door to division to enter into the church. Because a small infestation is how it spreads. Now I'm going to take you back to Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. Dave, if you could bring that back up. Uh, because there's some important words in here that, that help you understand the mission of Cornerstone. And I want to clarify it. Let's read those words again. Verse 14, this is Paul confronting Peter. He says, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force the Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? And I think what's important to understand here is this phrase, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile. See, this wasn't just Peter associating and not associating with people. 
This is Peter living a different way because of the experience that he had on the rooftop and a core belief that he had that he knew the law was not what would, would, what would give him grace, that it wasn't about the food that he ate. So he had a transformation so much so that he was living differently. And Paul calls it out. And the reason I bring this up is because we talk about the messy middle all the time as a church. And one thing I want to clarify is the messy middle that I talk about, our desire to bridge people together, political beliefs on left and right together, social beliefs left and right together, doctrinal disputes from left together. Our desire to play in the messy middle is not lukewarm. What is lukewarm is what we see in the story of Peter in this story. The messy middle is not pretending you care about people and when you walk away, you talk behind their back. The messy middle is not trying to be on the middle of the fence or, or, or not taking a stand on something. It's when you see people being harmed or, or when you see people, you see division or you see disunity in the church, it means you do speak about that. Again, we're gonna talk about that in the, in, in the later chapters in here, but the messy middle is not a lukewarm place that we pretend to care about people, that we act one way with a group of people and we act a different way with another group of people. We say, oh, you're right. Yeah, I, do, I agree with you. And we come over here and we say, yeah, you're right. I agree with you over here. Or I disagree or I disagree. The messy middle is the place where you try to bring people together. And if it's in a place where there is great sharp division and people are being harmed, or there is a place where people are, there's inferiority. Paul tells us that, the, that for the sake of unity, that needs to stop. What's beautiful about this story I think is that it, it serves to us as a painful lesson for Peter in his journey. And we know that in Peter's story, something changed after this moment because if you, write, if you read his writings in the books of First and Second Peter where he captures his thoughts, he talks about grace. He almost, almost overemphasizes that grace is enough. You know, that's the debate that, 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 that they were having in the early church in this day is that is grace enough? Is the grace of, of, of God, enough? is the sacrifice of Jesus enough? And some people didn't believe that. And, and Peter in his reflection and his writing writes extensively about how grace is truly enough. Almost overcompensating for the, the struggle that he has. But we see the power of unity in his and Paul's story, because we don't get any other description about what happened to him and Paul after this disagreement other than what Peter writes in 2 Peter 3.15. Here's what he says. He's talking about grace. He says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with you with the wisdom that God gave him. They still had a bond. He still had respect for one another. He still looked at Paul, who he had sharp disagreement with, even called him out publicly and said, that's my brother and our unity is more important. And so as we um, reflect on these words this week, I, I just wanna take you into a time of communion and a time of personal reflection. Um, because what I said at the beginning of this series is that uh, the sacrament of communion, which is simply a celebration of what Christ did for us on the cross. Uh, the elements that we take are not supernatural in terms of what they are, but I think they're supernatural in what they symbolize. Uh, because what they symbolize is the grace that is truly enough for each and every person, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, that the grace of Jesus, through his blood and his body and his sacrifice for us is truly enough. And when we take this sacrament, it binds us together throughout all the denominations in the world, throughout all the Christians' belief, and, and it reminds us that unity is most important. And so today we're gonna end on this time and may it be a personal time of reflection. 
of how maybe you have brought disunity in your family or with friendships, with coworkers, how have your opinions maybe beat somebody else down in your approach? How have your beliefs uh, maybe di- opened up the ugliness in your heart that you may have against people? And then when you drive down the street and you see a sign in a yard, it makes you think about somebody a different way. See, this, this is a, a sacrament that, that reminds us that God leveled the playing field and cares for all. And his deep and desperate desire is that we live in a way that's so different that his name would be lifted high in the way that we love and we treat one another, starting within the church. And so may this be an opportunity for you to reflect on the grace that's been given to you and the grace that you may have to give to others in the coming days and weeks and months ahead. Because it was on a night that Jesus was betrayed that he gave himself up and he had one final meal with his closest of friends. And it was during that meal that he took the bread that was on the table, lifted it up, broke it and gave thanks and said, this is my body broken and given for you. So if you would remove the cellophane as they did in the first century. <clears throat> he lifted it up and said, this is my body, take and eat the body of Christ given for you. And it was likewise later on in that meal that he took the cup off the table, lifted it up and gave thanks and said, this is my blood of the new covenant. What was the new covenant? That grace is enough. And that through his sacrifice, all shall be available to receive the gift of eternal life. He took the cup, raised it up, gave thanks and said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, remember, and believe the blood of Christ given for you. So Lord, we just come before you on this day. May you... uh, May you do a supernatural work in us. May these elements that we just took do a supernatural change in our hearts that if we have malice for somebody in our lives, if we have disagreement, if we have judgment, if we have prejudice, if we have ugliness in our heart, Lord, that you, we believe that you and your spirit can crush that spirit. And Lord, may you give us the supernatural ability to have disagreements, but not have division. Lord, may you give us the ability that we aren't the people, me personally, that I'm not the person who's modeling a behavior that may demean another person within the church or external to the church, that, I'm, that my words and actions matter, that it's not just a, a church, a symbol, a thing out there, but the church is the body of believers together. May we have the supernatural ability to have unity in the midst of division. Lord, we know we're not gonna agree on everything, but may we agree on the goodness of your grace being enough and may that be enough to fuel our unity together. Lord, we lift this day up to you. We believe you came. We believe you died. We believe you rose again. And we believe you are coming. Lord, may we live that way with one another. It's in your name that we pray, amen.